Welcome everyone to Statistically Significant. This is a UX research discussion group. It's for anybody who is practicing or interested in UX research. Um, we are going to record this and share it on um, the Product Hive YouTube channel later. So just know that you're being recorded. Um, we try to keep this thing fairly informal. So I may call on people. We appreciate it if you can turn your videos on just so we have a little bit of a sense of human connection. This event is mostly about networking and building relationships. So I love it when we have videos on so we can you know, get those nonverbal cues, make those connections. Um, but yeah, let's start by introducing me and my co-host. I am David Moore. I am the user research manager at DigiCert. I also teach UX design and research at Columbia University at a, a boot camp um, during the nights. Um, and yeah, Juliet, do you want to go next? Yes. Uh Hi, uh, I am currently working as a UX researcher at DigiCert. I've been there for almost six months and I have a background in instructional design and research, which is where I was coming from that I worked in for a couple of years. And I have my master's um, in instructional technology and learning sciences. And Anita, do you wanna go next? Yeah, so my name is Anita English. I am an associate user researcher at Vivint based here in Lehigh, Utah. Uh, I've been here for two years and a month. I think it's two years and a month now. So happy anniversary to me. Um, and <laughs> the rest of my team is in a room away from me, but there they all are. Um, it's been great. Uh, if we are talking about backgrounds, my background is actually in humanities. That was my undergrad. And then I did a UX design boot camp. Um, the one here, one of the larger ones is called Dev Mountain, um, and they offer um, iOS development, UX design, and QA. Nice. Dev Mountain props. Um, yeah, and always good to see the Vivin team. Hi, guys. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that next we want to thank our sponsors. We are unpaid volunteers associated with Product Hive. Product Hive has sponsors, including Lucid Chart, most notably, that helps with operational costs. So thank you to them for. Um, supporting us. Um, and I think that, I think that's pretty much everything. If you want to connect with people, why don't we have, um, why don't we have everyone drop their name, title, location, and if you would like your LinkedIn into the side chat, um, so you can add people, connect with people if you'd like to. Um, and yeah, we, 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 your host, will try to keep the conversation moving, but we do rely on interaction with the attendees, um, questions and responses from people who are here. So hopefully everybody's okay with that. Hopefully that's not too scary. Um, but yeah, Anita, am I missing anything? Do, do we cover our basics? No, I think that that covers it. Um, for everyone who saw maybe the post for this particular discussion, we're going to be talking a bit about recruiting, um, the pain points associated with it, um, workarounds, solutions, uh, stuff that's worked well, processes that have worked well, um, vendors. I think some people do use kind of like external um, third-party vendors. So we can talk a little bit about that. Um, and if there's time remaining, we can touch on the hybrid work home um, environments that maybe some of us are re-entering. Um, but let's, yeah, that's all we've got today. And awesome. Stop, stop, this, stop sharing, there we go. All right. Um, so yeah, maybe we went, before we get into like our, um, you know, prompted discussion, we can see if there's anybody new who has maybe a question that they wanna ask the group, a reason why they're here. Maybe I can put somebody on the spot. Raymond, thank you for having your video on. Do you wanna talk a little bit about what you do and what you're hoping to get out of this discussion? Uh, you bet. Oh, sorry. Am I, oh, I wasn't muted anyway, all right. Not even um, muted, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well. Um, Yes, I'm Raymond Lee. This discussion is particularly germane to me. I have a background in staffing and owned a staffing agency in San Francisco for 20 or more years. But for the last several years, I've been working on just a new solution to the staffing problem. And, um, and where it's led me is to solving it for freelancers. Um, because that, I didn't do that in San Francisco. We placed contractors, but they were all employees, W-2 employees. And so now my focus has been on um, enabling freelancers to make that a career. And like what problems need to be solved for freelancers to make, to make it a career if they choose to. And I'm 
specifically focused on researchers. So, um, so this is very germane to me. And um, I've done a, a couple of rounds of surveys to try to find pain points from the hiring managers, from the freelancers, to really try to understand the problem that I need to solve. So yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be learning more. Awesome. We're thrilled to have you. Yeah, I'm sure that pain points will come up in this discussion. They always do. So if you're looking to identify some of those, hopefully this will be helpful. Has anybody done freelance research that's on the call and maybe could talk about some of the struggles that existed there? That could be about recruiting or about some other aspect of the freelancing process. Anybody? I'll pause dramatically to pressure someone to speak up and drink some water. No one's done freelance, there's gotta be somebody. <laughs> I can speak up. Um, awesome. So yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing a project right now where I'm doing a bit of research on um, some conceptual stuff that I've been working on for design. Um, and the hardest part has been, I guess the recruiting. Thankfully, the person I'm working with is um, kind of tapping into their, their, um, their network to recruit people that I can test with um, and interview. But it's pretty different from what I experienced in my full-time job where we have usertesting.com, so I can just send out a test anytime I want. Um, so that's like a really different, um, different feel. Yeah, absolutely. I can relate to that. Um, so is this a, a freelance project that you're working on and one of the main difficulties is recruiting? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Anybody have a similar experience or another struggle based on freelancing? Just to stick with Raymond's topic for a minute. I've got another struggle. Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, so one of my struggles was I had not previously worked with developers. And um, so after I created the product, um, I'm still sort of a part of the team uh, with the people who are building it. And I just didn't know how many problems they would run into or how difficult it would be. So I didn't have a good measure of um, what a first version should be like versus later on down the road. Okay. And so wait, what, what are you doing and how are you working with the developers right now? Um, so I, I'm sort of a consultant right now. So mm -hmm. for like two months, I was working on building the actual design. And um, I'm actually part of a freelance company um, that I do on the side. And so um, I just... Oh, we, that company didn't actually get created until after I was done with the freelance project. So I just referred my client over. And um, so right now I'm there if, if they have any questions. So they send me a message and I'm there when I hear, I'm here to hear all of the rest of their complaints and their worries and concerns that the developers are, are speaking. But um, yeah, I didn't know about any of that because I'd never worked with developers before. There you go. Um, yeah. About then, or before the, my current job. So it was, that makes sense. I don't know. It's like a struggle, a future struggle that you don't quite know until you're there. You know, something to look forward to. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, interactions with developers can be challenging for a number of reasons in my experience, whether it's, you know, the designer trying to hand off something and getting produced correctly or just getting buy-in for the UX process and data-driven decision-making in general, um, that can certainly be a struggle. Um, in my experience, donuts go a long way. I don't know if you have the opportunity to, to bring some uh, like pastry gifts to your de developers, but that, that has helped me in the past. Um, any, anyone else have experienced freelancing and have a struggle that they want to maybe reference? So I've done a little bit of freelancing work um, and just, so I was just helping a, a new company starting off and they wanted just to kind of understand the market for their, for what they were doing. Um, and basically I just kind of Googled it a lot and used Google Scholar, but without like a university or without like a, um, academic journals or, or things like that, it was more difficult to find um, resources that were more statistically significant or just actually real. Um, do you guys know any resources that are like that? Um, for like market segmentation data? Mm -hmm. I know that they exist. 
Um, does anybody know offhand a good resource for identification of market segments? I, I can like ping my PMM team after this. I know that like there's a guy on my marketing team who asked about a subscription to some sort of like market segment data publication, um, but it's not something that I have used or I'm particularly familiar with. Okay. Yan is approaching the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're kind of sitting here as a group. So if we got to come up close and on the, um, what, what kind of segmentation data? Because depending on the industry you're in, it's going to be a different set of segments. And oftentimes it's kind of specific to your company, um, depending yeah. on how your outlook on the industry. So we did some segmentation research a couple of years ago and we engaged an outside firm and it was a, a big expensive project to do that. There's obviously simpler and cheaper ways to do it as well. Yeah, you know, are there other? Yeah, I'll give you a bit of that, we'll do it. But. Yeah, what would be like a simpler yes. way of doing it? So the, the company's doing urban farming. Um, so they want to build a community of urban farmers and they wanted to know more about urban farmers. It's not a super big community. That's that's kind of why. So I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at urban farms. I was trying to understand and like talking to people there. Um, I don't know if there is any data maybe, but um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different layers at which you can do segmentation and, and you may decide that, um, you know, doing it at a very simple level is enough. Probably, mm -hmm. you know, starting out by just finding a few people in that market that seem different from each other and kind of interviewing them and seeing what they have in common, what's different and starting to see maybe some different segments emerging from that. You could ultimately try to find a big enough sample that you could do a survey with them. And then, you know, from your interviews, you may have identified these are the main similarities and differences. So these are the factors on which I might segment the market and then run a survey uh, based, you know, to ask questions about those different factors. And then once you've run the survey, say, okay, you know, 20% have these things in common, that's one segment, you know, 30% have these things in common or, you know, are most like this group here. And mm -hmm. so you could do it at a fairly simple level, I would imagine, if, given your context that you're in. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I totally agree with that approach. I think that kind of traditional ways, like, yeah, creation of personas, right? Sort of like, you know, qualitative moderated interviews with people who fit the target problem space or target user group that you're exploring. And then I think Jared Spool says to just do those interviews until you reach the point of least astonishing enlightenment, right? So wait till patterns emerge and then keep on interviewing till the patterns stop emerging. So it may be, you know, maybe seven, maybe 20, maybe 50 people you talk to. Identify the important attributes that you want to segment by, probably things like scale, experience, location, right? See if there's different behaviors based on those groupings. And then you probably want a mixed methods approach where you validate that quantitatively, at which point recruitment might become the issue, right? Because I would imagine you can probably in your own personal network or through LinkedIn or, or through social media of some kind, you could identify enough people to do the qual portion, but launching a survey where you want to get like 300 or 400 responses. So you have statistical significance to validate those findings can be challenging, which is sort of the topic we want to talk about today, which is awesome. Um, Raymond, are, did you have any follow-up questions for any of the problems from our freelancers that you wanted to dig into a little bit more? Oh wait, this time you are muted. <laughs> I, um, I really didn't get any juicy problems here from the group. The, the, the biggest ones I've discovered on my own are the difficulty of marketing yourself, finding contracts is like problem number one for freelancers. And then just the high transaction costs with each engagement, like having to find them, negotiate a contract, wait until it starts. And so, so my solution for freelancers is around that, just trying to make it easier to find you know, projects and lower the transaction costs. So you don't have to negotiate a new contract with every one. Anyway, so some of those kinds of things. That, that resonates with me. My, so I did freelancing for a little while and I, I was just terrible at like marketing myself. I relied strictly on word of mouth for new clientele, which was you know, not, not particularly um, scalable. Um, 
so that that kind of resonates with me. The other thing that I found difficult was, um, at least initially, was predicting like labor cost per project, some way of like estimating what like the amount of work the project was going to involve was. Those were both kind of challenges that I faced. So Raymond, is your is your software solution specifically for UX researchers who are doing freelance work or just freelancers in general? Just researchers. Just researchers. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I would imagine that some of the problems you're hearing here are probably fairly common. Recruitment, maybe less so interaction with developers. Um, method selection could be, but maybe less so, but certainly recruitment. So let's pivot to talking about recruitment at this point. I feel like this has been something that like recruitment has always been a challenge for me and the teams that I've worked with. Um, it's always something that we're trying to improve. I feel like we've gotten better at it. We've employed some methods to try and mitigate some of the wasted time and frustration around that process. But I know Cassie, you, you talked a little bit about the difficulties you had with recruitment and you're mitigating that through a partner who's helping you. Have, have you had any other strategies or workarounds that have helped solve or reduce the pain points in your recruitment process, either at this current freelancing gig or, or at your day job or some other experience you've had? Um, yeah, yeah, I've been trying a ton of different things. So um, one thing that's I think is gonna be helpful, but we'll have to see um, is uh, we have a, an annual summit that we host. Um, so this is my day job. Um, and during that, we did a large user, we called it user feedback lab and it was basically a large testing effort. Um, and so um, at the end of all of those tests, I asked participants in just like the, we used user testing for this and it was unmoderated. Just asked the final question was, would you like to participate in future sessions? You know, we'll compensate you. And so we now have a, a pretty good list of people who are willing to participate in future research. Um, another thing I tried, which is kind of interesting, we made a survey and we were having trouble getting people to take it um, by sending it out to clients. So instead we actually just funneled it through user testing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we put the link in there and then we just launched like four tests on our unlimited account and we're able to get, I think like 60 participants um, nice. just from that. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing we're gonna try, I think is some sort of thing with onboarding for our summit this year um, to try to recruit some folks. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that idea. We did this, we did, we've done the same thing at Digicert where there's like sales summits or marketing driven events. And the research team doesn't really have to do a lot of effort to get one of our people to go either in person with a, with, with a clipboard or an iPad or get the marketing team to attach a single question to the you know satisfaction right. so they're already sending that afterwards. That can be a great way to drive what participation. What are you talking about? <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> um, I needed well, him just in case you didn't say that. <laughs> uh, um, Anita, how about you? What is what has your team struggled with and what have been your workarounds? I like how you're pointing to me because I am I am gonna say a lot of things because I can't I can't stop. Um so something that we uh, do depending on the project, if the project requires for like some sort of additional um computer customer interaction, we'll actually send out a survey um, on the topic. And then at the end, we'll have opt-ins. Would you be willing and interested in participating in follow-up phone call? Um, I did recently send one that was pretty detailed. It was, would you be willing and interested in participating in mobile design feedback? Um, for which I still got yeses, um, but there were more maybes and more no's than other ones that we did sent out because I don't know, surfacing what more of the project was. Maybe they'd feel like they knew more about what they were signing up to do than a big like, oh, I'm doing a phone call or I'm doing a video call or like something else. Um, again, depending on the project, we, we do have at least one field research project in flight. Um, so for that, we did more extensive recruiting for which we sent out a very specific survey that was like, this is what we're gonna be doing. Um, these are some questions about your satisfaction uh, with us, with this product that we're studying, um, with some like general usage questions and the opt-in. Can we talk to you on the phone and um, then screen you in for field visits? Can we come to your home? Can we see you? 
can we walk around and see see the this thing that we're we're studying? Um, we also employ uh, some stuff through usertesting.com. Uh, I can't say we do a ton of. Actually, no, I take that back. We do recruit. Um, we will use that more for our non customers um, to get competitor customers or just consumers of technology, not necessarily attached to any of our competitors. Um, yeah. If anybody from my team wants to jump in, <laughs> that would be a great time. <laughs> I saw a thumbs up and a uh, dismissive hand wave. I think you covered it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it seems like it must be uniquely challenging to try and schedule field visits. Um, I would imagine that there's a lower opt-in rate for that type of research, but I guess I don't know. Do you, do you have what? Do you know roughly what like success percentage you have when it comes to recruitment for field? Oh, and he is pointing. <laughs> uh, someone's getting called. On. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder if I can awkwardly wait until somebody. Yes. He's good. <laughs> Good. I'm just going to unmute them. <laughs> is, is this the talking chair? It's the talking chair. You got it. Okay. Yeah. No, so for that specific project, um, we were, I was very, so for this project, actually no one on our team was going. We were sending uh, like product designers and things like that. So we had to like be a little bit more careful about it. I had to make sure that they were good people. They had a good system. Like they talked well, answered questions. So we say so we sent out this survey and we were very specific in this survey especially even just in the email, like <clears throat> here's our topic, here's the stuff, because the people who generally have like these type of things in their system is hunting comes in their home. Uh, we wanted to make sure that those people knew what they were getting into. And then generally for this type of thing, like people kind of like to show it off. Mm -hmm. And so they knew what they were getting into. So the opt-in rate was slightly lower than general. Normally it's around half and half, like half the people will say that, sure, you can contact me for very general. This was a bit lower, <clears throat> but the people that we did contact, from those, that percentage is way higher as far as who, who responded back to us and did screening interviews and things like that. So like I, you know, maybe 30% of people said yes. Actually, it was probably a little bit higher because only people who kind of had in situations opted into the survey. But I mean, I contacted, we went to Denver and I, I only sent out emails of people who responded from Denver to maybe 10 people in Denver. And we had six screening calls and five of them were in home business. That's so. Amazing. I don't know if my experience has just been like really bad, but that seems like an insanely high participation rate to me. We get like, I don't know, we probably get like 2% of people to respond to like survey requests. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, so that's not counting the people who have got the survey and didn't take the survey. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So that's only those of the, like the 5% <laughs> who maybe actually took the survey from those we sent it out to. Gotcha. Then of those people, about half of those said, sure, I'd be willing to talk about my, you know, my system, about my, my technology with us. And then about half of those I responded to came on screening calls. We talked to them and pretty much all of them were, were good for home visits. Gotcha. Have, so have you guess that's 1%. Okay. okay. That makes more sense. Um, have you guys tried um, having like a dedicated recruiter? Have you ever worked with a dedicated recruiter either third party or have somebody on the team who's just, you know, the research coordinator or whatever? We have used a recruiting firm, but I mean, it's not something we do very often. Yeah. And generally I think for stuff, for stuff like that is we're trying to get stuff with non-customers. Gotcha. Just standard consumers. That but makes yeah, sense. I mean, we, have, we have toyed around with the idea. We've talked about it multiple times. Of if we had a dedicated position that was just a recruiter, someone sketching type of stuff, like what would that do for us? How much more useful would that be? And it would be nice. I agree. Yeah, it seems like, I, I don't know. Yeah, I've toyed with the idea as well. I, I'm in the same position as you, where when we've needed like, you know, a broader market landscape description or access to people who, who aren't our users, we've gone through like a research firm. But that was like, I mean, it's prohibitively expensive. I think it was like 250,000 for a mixed methods, large scale study that we wanted in a short time period. Granted, all of those attributes make that thing expensive, but still it's just like crazy expensive. I've never worked with like a dedicated recruiter though. I'm like getting emails right now from people who are like, hey, I have email addresses and names for people that are in this segment. I've never like tried anything like that. I've never reached out to like a professional recruiter who just 
coordinates the research. And I've also never like used, I think we used user testing like one time, we did like the demo. Um, but yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. How about um, Sam? Sam, I know you have your video off, but how are you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear and see your photo. How, how has your experience with recruiting been? Do you struggle with that? Have you got some um, things you've done to help mitigate that struggle? Um, I don't have a, a ton of experience with it. Um, nearly as much as I would like in, in the professional space. Typically, I've, I've relied on um, vendors to help me find people, right? Or, you know, either using Qualtrics or userinterviews.com to, to find people, like setting up the specifications and they, they go out and find them or people self-select into um, the survey like that. And that's worked pretty well. Um, but I haven't encountered necessarily a lot of the use cases that are being talked about here. Gotcha. It does seem like, um, you know, if you, if you subscribe to a software solution that has a panel taking advantage, that seems like a good idea. That seems like a solid workaround for recruitment difficulties, provided you aren't, you know, trying to target maybe a really specific niche user group. Um, Sam, what, what types of users were you targeting, if you wouldn't mind? Because it sounds like that was working for you. I'm just curious if like that was a specific segment or if it was a pretty broad user group you were targeting. Um, well, more recently, we were just targeting <clears throat> regular consumers representative of the US Census. So that's pretty easy for a organization like user interviews or you know um, Qualtrics to, to do, right? They, they do, that's their bread and butter. They do it all the time. Um, and if, if we need, um, at least at, at MX right now, if we need to talk to clients, that's, that's always a, a pain in the butt. And it, their, their time is so valuable to them. These people are paid really well, <laughs> typically, or they're, they're super crazy busy executives. Um, and it's just really hard to, to get them to uh, do interviews or, or take surveys in general. And we're still in the process of trying to figure out how we can incentivize that more or create scenarios where they're more likely to. Um, so that's like, that's still in the, the strategy stage. Well, because our last round of MPS like survey requests was just abysmal. We got like a 2% response rate. And so we're like, oh crap, what, what are we gonna do now? And we're, we're looking into, again, because we're a B2B space, it's kind of unique, but uh, we're looking into trying to leverage um, different avenues for getting that sort of feedback or talking to specialists through uh, a cab situation. So a client advisory board, maybe setting up communities where there are enough perks to keep them involved in it, right? where they get to have all these uh, incentives of being able to um, network with each other. And then when we get them together, say like, please give us data. <laughs> you know, yeah. We we'd really like your feedback on this now that we have you here and uh, you're, you're socially obligated to us, please give us data. <laughs> You built some like emotional equity with the user group and now they have to respond to your messages. Yeah. Um, but with regular consumers, it's, I, I'd say it's way more efficient to go through a recruiting agency. It's just way easier. It doesn't have to be as expensive as Qualtrics. There's groups like Fiverr that are really easy to, to access people. Um, and yeah. But like if, if you're after a really specific niche audience, that's just hard across the board. Yeah, yeah. So you're, uh, you're talking about trying to target like banking executives, right? For like the, this NPS survey? Is that or, right? or people further down in financial organizations too. But like, again, a lot of them are 
it's just really difficult to convince them. I, I, I suspect that they are getting barraged from all sorts of different avenues for feedback and data. Um, that's the sense we get. And, and there's some anecdotal feedback from, from clients. And I don't know about you guys, but I get asked to take surveys all the time from all sorts of different avenues, right? And vendors. And I think people's desperation for data may actually be affecting a <laughs> society-wide fatigue for survey. And so you, you just have to create a significant enough incentive to get it like, okay, well, this is, this is worth my time. I've been willing to join some of those specialized groups or interviews or take surveys when they pay me for my time, right? But like, hey, first of all, I'm intrinsically motivated in your product. I want it to su succeed because I use it. Also, I see that you, you know, you recognize that I'm a UX researcher, how much I probably get paid per hour. Um, you should probably pay me for my time and then it's worth it for me, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky when you, especially if you don't have the resources to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like I'm in like a related boat kind of at a dessert where it's not that the people who we're trying to target have incredibly valuable time, like a, you know, like a, a, a bank executive or a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. But um, we, we target like IT admins who maybe like 5%, 2% of their time is dedicated to uh, managing SSL certificates. So it's a really like small part of their jobs so that I don't I feel like they're not as invested in providing feedback to us, um, which is challenging, obviously. Um, yeah, but I think that like, yeah, we, it's interesting because we just didn't like, we didn't use incentives for a long time. We just didn't. Um, we've kind of recently started using them and we, we saw about a like, you know, we saw a bump in the number of respondents, but not as big as I was expecting it to be. There were small incentives too, but um, yeah, it was kind of interesting to see, like, see that experiment play out. Um, Cause right now we're just sort of like, we know that we get like this percentage response rate to like surveys. So we just know how many people we have to launch to. But yeah, I think, I think you could be right about like sort of society wide fatigue happening. Um, it's just yeah. a hypothesis. I, I have, absolutely no proof of that yet <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at least i see it in my own life and i i suspect that people in positions of power and have a lot of money and influence are getting barraged even more because people want their attention so badly yeah yeah we haven't run any experiments to see like um you know like running experience about like frequency of survey distribution related to like uh number of responses. But I think at bare minimum, you do need to be concerned about like throttling, right? Just like how many times are you pinging your own users um, to participate in research? And how can you avoid, how can you like distribute that? Right? Oh, that's a really good point, David. Yeah, we've, we've had to be cognizant of that with, with our, our clients as well. <laughs> you know, of course, we want all of this data around their their client journey so that we can create a better experience for them and really know what their temperature is along the entire way. But they also find it annoying if you ask them about it all the time, right? And so, for example, with our support team, I believe they're in the process of, of setting up a system for, I think it's in Salesforce, where like a client can only receive so many CSAT survey um, requests a month, right? The same person only gets like one is allowed to only get one or two per month. So we're not going to send it to them every single touch point. They're like, yep, just like last time, you know, and otherwise you train them to ignore it, right? You, <laughs> you incentivize them to avoid you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does yeah. anyone in the meeting have experience um, trying to not contact people more than once a month? that isn't through a service uh, that does it for you? 
Wait, can you say it again, Lawrence? I missed the first. Yeah, sure. First. Can you can you hear me? This yeah. is a new headset. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I was wondering if anyone on the call has any experience making sure that you don't contact the same person more than once or more than twice or a certain amount a month um, without having a service do it for you. Because uh, I, I just started at a new company and um, we don't have anything like that. I think we really we really could use it. On, on our side, it took some Salesforce engineering, right? You, you have to be able to have people that can go in and set up SQL statements that, you know, all of the if then statements that are like, if this is the case within these parameters, send it, right? If not, so you, so you have to have the technical resources to, to be able to do that or teach yourself how. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are, are there any non SQL solutions? Like, because I think I could like write a query, but I don't know if I could create the database. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of that. I just know that uh, we <laughs> we had a resource that was willing to, to set that up for us in Salesforce. So we're like, Got great, it. we don't have to figure it out. <laughs> so. Got it. Well, that's very nice. Yeah. Maybe I can talk someone into that. <laughs> Are the, so are the emails getting distributed through Salesforce in that scenario? Yeah, a Qualtrics Salesforce integration. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm curious to hear if anybody has a good solution for this, because I feel like I don't really have a, a, a great advice to offer here, but um, kind of three different things I've done in the past. One, when I was the sole researcher, I had like, I used Excel and word to do mail merges based on database queries I got pulled from the engineering team. So I just had a list of people who I had contacted and I would just build out that Excel document and flag for duplicates. So I just knew who I had emailed already. Um, and then another thing I've done is when I was working with a team, same solution, but using SharePoint. So we just had one document we worked off of. And now what we're doing, which works great for me, but I can't like I don't know how you would like, it's like what you were saying, a third party solution. The marketing team now is in charge of distribution of our research emails. So they send through Eloqua and they can track, you know, who has been contacted in X amount of time and just, you know, uh, make sure that people aren't getting pinged too much because of that. So I don't know if any of those are options, but does anybody else have experience with, um, you know, limitation of, what I would call throttling because of pendo terminology. I would just say the same thing, David, that you were saying, like with the Excel spreadsheet, I just created a column that like I documented the date that I reached out to them. And like, cause I felt like if I was like filtering for duplicates, I also wanted to have like an actual date tracked on like, okay, this is the exact last time I contacted them, um, but yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's kind of a hacky solution, but you know, if that's the only thing you've got, that's an option. Um, I wonder. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up? Uh, so yeah, when you were setting up the Excel document and flagging for duplicates, um, uh, did you also include other filters that might be some sort of like you know, segment of your uh, user group that you were trying to filter for? That's a great question. Yeah. So I think I had fields for like number of certificate and sales channel um, at the time, which were kind of like the two big ways that we were filtering people. Um, I assume if you had like more that that would be potentially beneficial. But again, this was just like a really like quick and dirty way to get like the, the, the job done, just making sure that I wasn't like pinging people. And then I could also use the same document to like, if anybody said something that was like implied they were not happy about receiving invitations to do research, you know, I could blacklist them in that same document as well, right? Which is, that's another thing we're sort of doing now. So we have like, we have the emails that go, th go out through Eloqua and they keep track of like opt outs through that. And then we also target people using in-app feedback through Pendo. And so for that, we have like a, a blacklist of just users that we keep. If we ever see a like, you know, low NPS score where the person says, I'm like giving you this rating because this stupid pop-up is annoying, which doesn't happen often, which is good news. I, I feel like we're not getting too many pieces of feedback like that. But I think, you know, the five we've gotten in the past two years or whatever, th those people have all been blacklisted. So they're just never shown a survey again inside of the app. 
which is one way to also help with that. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all David, this, all oh, of sorry. the highlights for me that like, <laughs> because I mean, all of, all of us are aware of this, but like when I, every time I see a, a response rate really below 20, 20%, I'm like, oh man, there's so many things we could be missing. Like, cause we're already only getting the people that respond to surveys, right? Mm -hmm. That, that unique group. And we're just not getting the full insight. And sometimes I worry if, if we're, we have these huge blind spots uh, as companies, as businesses, because we're not, or, or research organizations, because we're just not getting a high response rate. And whether or not in the, those situations, it's like, okay, we need to bag surveys. This response rate is low. We just need to go the, the longer, harder route and get interviews with people and pay them enough and maybe not do as many. Um, but, and, and we need to talk to the, we really need to talk to the people that don't want to talk to us, <laughs> like doubling down on that group that doesn't respond because, you know, I, I would say like, especially in the case of a B2B, right. They might be your biggest risk or like they might be the ones where your product just isn't filling the gap. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, to, to resolve that blind spot, I just feel like sometimes we might need to totally change our attack and be more aggressive and be like, okay, we're going to do interviews. We're going to pay them sufficiently to, to show them that we value their time. Um, we're going to make it super easy for them to participate in like a no duh, like, of course I'd do that situation. And marshal all of the relationships that people in our company might have with those people to get them to participate, right? And I think we, I think we probably fall back on surveys too much in that case. But that, that, that's sorry, that's my little soapbox moment. No, I totally agree. I love it. So I, I completely agree. I mean, you are kind of like necessarily setting yourself up for a sampling error if you are only using one type of recruitment or one type of method, right? Which is, I think, why what you're talking about about like building out the customer advisory board or client advisory board, um, maybe selecting specific clients that individual sales agents have good relationship with that they can do introductions for, so you get some of those bigger, busier customers to actually talk to you. Um, making sure that you're using, you know, the in-app feedback and like the support tickets and chats and the you know people who are responding to surveys to build a holistic picture of your user base rather than focusing on just one method can all be ways to like mitigate that you're you're making me sweat though because like that if that 20 percent is the threshold like we're not doing a good job we just haven't relied on like incentivizing we've just like built out our practice to take into account the response rate we get without incentives well Which, our response like, rate yeah our response rate at my previous company with incentives to surveys was between one and 2%. So don't feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were like, well, without we're incentives, all, we're like, we're all pretty <laughs> abysmal uh, based on what I've been hearing. Um, <laughs> I talked to one company that had a hundred percent response rate and wow. they're, but they were, they were a much smaller organization. They were a consulting organization. Right. And they had a hundred percent, a percent response rate because they would set up a specific call with each client with the client representative and and the and the researcher right and they would go through the survey with them like in that interview right and they would kind of fill it out for them they would just set up the call be like okay we're going to do this and and then that they were able to get and, and they also set precedent for it. Like part of our relationship with us as a company is that we care really a, a ton about how you think. And whenever we have an engagement or relationship with the client, we set up this yearly or bi-yearly interview. And you know that it's coming, you know what to expect, we're gonna do it. It's, it's part of the deal, right? Um, and then, that situation created a, a really high response rate. 
But then, of course, it it injected the possibility of bias or trying to make people happy because you have, you know, a relationship with someone at that company and you don't want to make them feel bad in the moment. And so they, they recognized that that was a limitation of their data, but they thought it was worth it to get the, the high response rate, right? To, and, and just trust that these people would be honest enough that it would really give them a, a super clear and obvious view of, of how their clients were feeling about the relationship. Yeah, that's intense. 100% response rate is amazing. Um, that's fascinating. A um, couple questions in the chat here, um, about 10 minutes left. Um, looks like we're curious about what kind of incentives people have used and found success with. So I think that like, yeah, customer advisory board, we've like booked hotel rooms and like taken them to dinner and had like them present to each other and we present to them. And then the small portion of the event is like doing like a research focus group where we get a like chance to talk to everybody. That's like a huge incentive, right? Fly you out to Aspen for like the weekend and we'll all like talk about internet security for two days straight with each other. Um, smaller incentives, we've like printed t-shirts and sent them out to people who are particularly good on calls to try and build recurring relationships with people. So we have like the, the user research customer list, Project Urkel. Um, that we keep track of people who we have like, just want to like, we're like, this was a good interview. This person's easy to talk to. They're giving us the right amount of information. They fit a good segment. Um, that's been helpful. Just like t-shirts sent to people and sent, saying thank you, um, which is like a small incentive. And then we've done like cash incentives too. We've only done like, you know, five or $10 Amazon cards or Visa gift cards. Um, I think if you're targeting a more specific group or you want to have a better response rate in a shorter amount of time that you do have to up those incentives. Um, you know, just to be commensurate with the users you're targeting. But um, anybody else have experience with incentives that they wouldn't mind discussing? Anita, giving us thumbs up. Well, that just means she agrees. How about Lauren? Yeah. You agree. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I just finished an interview where we did it for free because they're benefiting from the business, business relationship here. Um, previously, the, intent, the incentives were a hundred an hour um, at the at Bluehost, which was uh, very nice. Uh, so it we got like uh, it changed depending on like which group of people we talked to. Though I noticed, so like bloggers would be there, all of them, a hundred percent for a hundred dollars. But like small business owners might be there for like maybe seventy percent would show up. Um, and I think they were kind of balancing their the amount of money they would make in that time versus talking to us. Um, uh, I've never, I've never thought about t-shirts or swag or anything that, that could be really great. Um, and so that gives me a lot to think about. Yeah. Yeah. We've gotten like when the marketing department had leftover stuff, we've been sent like backpacks and things like that, just to say thank you to people for participating. Found that to be a little bit helpful. Um, there's some, some of these people like I've, had on you know calls for like years now i like know them by name but um but yeah that can be helpful um another question so let's see a question from aaron aaron yeah how often do you use data or look for research opportunities from customer care or technical support tickets we've um we've done this both from like our in-app feedback that people use we just have like a barrage of data from there that we try to segment by like I think it's sometimes called like disposition or like theme from a dropdown. So we can just report like here, here's how many people in each of these buckets every quarter are like submitting feedback. And then we do like an in-depth analysis of like themes based on that as well. Um, but customer care technical support tickets. So we have, this is kind of a weird one. We've looked at the chats, but we don't have a way to consume them. Like the, the format of the, the chats is like not accessible to my team. We need like a, a somebody with more technical proficiency to, to consume that data. So we haven't done that. We've again done like disposition monitoring. And we've also, this is kind of a weird workaround with a little bit of bias injected, but I felt like it was good enough for the project we were working on. And it was confirmed by other research. We've talked to support agents. So we sent a survey out to our support agents. We did interviews with our support agents. Um, we've done a support, like a support agent focus group. Where we just talked to people like, what are the most common topics that are coming up right now? Things like that, I feel like are a good way to sort of like, quickly get that data. You typically have very easy access to employees at your own organization. So we've tried that. Has anybody had experience consuming 
support calls, chats, or tickets, and would be willing to like touch on that quickly for Aaron. I made like one relationship with someone in support and they would uh, send me a bunch of things that were happening uh, just constantly. And it just became like way too much to manage. Um, and then uh, I said, you know, thank you, but I, I can't, I can't handle all these support things. Like I'm not in charge of any of this. Um, it, it's hard to triage because I'm not like ne necessarily working on the things that are problems. Sorry, it can't be more helpful. Can, no, no, I think that's a good Sorry, call. David, what was the question again? So have you ever uh, like consumed support chats, calls, transcripts, or tickets and gotten findings out of that that helped, you know, maybe give directional input to the product or tickets? Yes. Tickets, yes. What was yeah. the process like for you? What did that look like? Um, so uh, to a great extent. I, I did that at Domo because they had such a good job. They did such a good job of documenting. Um, so the support reps had a system, a, a process set up where they were supposed to tag. They'd already gone through the process of identifying appropriate tags and done the research there, right? And um, each ticket was tagged in a certain way to like to give us an idea of why the ticket occurred, right? And I was able to use that and correlate it with other data I was gathering, NPS, CSAT, whatever, right? And find correlations between them. So that made that super easy. I didn't, you know, the, the time involved in, in reading transcripts, uh, going through calls, that's, that's, the, that's the support manager's job, you know? That's their job to figure out what patterns uh, are happening there and to report back to something like us. And in my opinion, that's the research that they need to do. Um, here at uh, MX though, I've, I've, you know, if, if you have a touch point survey, like a CSAT survey set up for support, you can learn a lot there just by doing a quick um, textual analysis of, of comments, you know. You can use a, a tool like text, you know, text IQ, Qualtrics, or Enjoy HQ to like find some patterns there really quickly without having to review all of the tech. You know, it's like became very apparent after my most recent analysis that like, hey, uh, it's clear that what makes people satisfied is that we resolve their ticket <laughs> and we do it quickly. And duh, right? As far as like. Uh, why they're unhappy. It's more often not than not support, but it's that we're sending them the survey too early because we haven't fixed it, or there's limitations with the product. And it's pretty, it becomes pretty obvious like what, what limitations are the product that are causing the dissatisfaction, and then I can deliver that back to, back to the business, right? Um, so, yeah, there's, there's value there, but it's really important for, like you were talking about Lauren, like if you, if you wanna be able to have the time to actually get value out of it, it's much more ideal if the support team has a system for uh, tagging things and has a, a pretty robust support or CSAT survey, touch point survey um, going on. If that's in place, you you can get value out of it for sure. Yeah, totally agree. I think yeah, in both the case where in, in Lauren's situation or Sam's situation, like there's a lot of like you have to be concerned about the volume that you're dealing with and how you're going to consume that, right? Because like doing qualitative analysis manually is really it's like exponentially more difficult the more data you get, right? Um, it's not like twice as much data is twice as hard. It's like four times as hard to consume. So find, yeah, finding a tool like in vivo or whatever that like you can like tag themes and just like automate that or crowdsource it, right? So like that the support team is doing it for you by disposition tracking in their, in their like um, call tool or the customers are doing it in like a CSAT um, following the call or, or chat is like, those are all good ways. And you might find that the support team is just already tracking it too. I mean, the support team probably has a list of priorities based on the calls that they're getting 
you know, that they may have already ranked in, in order of importance for you. So that might just be a way you can say, okay, look, I'm fine. I've got these insights and that is backed up by these, you know, JIRAs that are created by the support team in order of importance. And you can combine that and just like not have to do any more research to just back up some of your existing findings. All right. It looks like we're about at time. Thank you so much for everyone who came, especially thank you to everyone who participated in the conversation. Um, we'll share this out on YouTube. We would love to see you at the next one. If you are not in the Product Hive Slack team in the Research Practices channel, that is kind of where our home base is. Feel free to join that team. Just Google Product Hive Slack. And we hope to see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone.